Hello, everyone. Uh, bonjour à tous. So uh, I would like to invite um, to the podium um, the participants in the session. So we have uh, Corinne Clignon, um, head of department, uh, Digital Health Mission Auto Autorité de Santé, uh, Michel Dumontier, distinguished professor of data science at Maastricht University, uh, Marc Julien, uh, co-CEO and COO at uh, Dibaloop, Nancy Miller-Rich, who is joining us online. Is Nancy there? Is Nancy on the screen? I can't see. So Nancy Miller-Rich, uh, Chairman of uh, Biotherix and uh, Director at a number of uh, pharma companies, also um, uh, retired from uh, being uh, Chief Innovation Officer from, uh, for Merck. And uh, Farhad Nezami, lead investigator at Brigham and Women's Hospital and faculty member in the Department of Surgery at Harvard Medical School. Uh, my name is Daniela Rus. I am a robotics AI machine learning researcher. Um, so I'm very much a computer scientist, um, but very interested in uh, uh, how um, our, our tools, our technologies can have an impact in medicine. Um, so can I verify that Nancy is with us? She is? Okay. Hello, Nancy. Ah, here you are. It's good to see you. Um, all right. So um, when we designed the program for the symposium, we, we kind of imagined that we'd have a first session on data, uh, which is um, so a, a, a sort of a universal language for AI and for medicine. And then we would have a session uh, more from the point of view of technology, uh, looking towards the application, and then we would have a session more from the point of view of the application, um, looking towards the technology. So our session here uh, is on um, AI uh, from the point of view of technology. And so let me see if I can uh, get my, um, uh, if I can get technology to work. I'm trying to share my screen, but I cannot. Uh, I cannot share my screen. Can you please empower me to share my screen? And see, technology is always a, a, a bit of a problem. It's a good part of the solution, but I cannot share my screen. Um, so, um, all right. So uh, let's see. Um, okay, here we go. So I wanted to put some, um, some pictures on the screen for you um, because I believe a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, when, I, um, when I think about AI in medicine, I see tremendous um, opportunities that are uh, enabled by three interconnected fields working together to create a world where we can better monitor, diagnose, and treat uh, disease. And these three interconnected fields are um, robotics, which put, uh, puts computation in motion and gives machines autonomy, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, gives machines the ability to reason, and machine learning, uh, which cuts across decision-making and physical movement to enable machines to learn, improve, and make predictions. So when we talk about AI, we usually mean all three of these fields uh, lumped uh, together. And I believe that together these fields can do some extraordinary things. I wanna give you um, uh, a short example. And in this example, uh, researchers at Harvard um, had a, a data set consisting of scans of lymph node cells, and um, they gave these, uh, this data to humans and to machine learning uh, and asked to please diagnose cancer. But the humans made 3.5% uh, uh, error in the diagnosis, while the AI system made 7.5% error. But when the two worked together, the AI and the human improved accuracy by 80% uh, to achieve only 0.5% uh, error, uh, which is something that gets me really excited because it really shows me that AI um, is a tool that can be adopted and that can empower um, physicians. Now, um, from this point of view, I really like to see uh, or to think about what we do as creating tools that help um, uh, medical practitioners with cognitive and physical tasks, uh, not, um, not as tools that replace the, uh, the practitioners. Now, these kinds of tools are, uh, are currently deployed in the world's most advanced treatment centers. But imagine a future where everyone has access to these tools, where with the use of AI and machine learning, 
any physician, um, whether they are in, uh, overworked and cannot uh, keep up with the clinical trials, or whether they are in a rural setting where they don't quite have the infrastructure uh, to, run, um, to run the most advanced algorithms online, any physician uh, could use the power of these tools to offer their patients the most advanced and most relevant uh, treatments. Uh, this is the kind of future that I'm very inspired um, to, to help build. But now, um, in order to get to that future, we have to think a little bit about our tools, what they're good at and what they're not good at. And, um, and so I'd like to start by observing that today's AI solutions are uh, primarily building on decades old technologies that are enhanced by data and computation. And so a, a first uh, challenge to all of us is to come up with new ideas and build new kinds of solutions. Now, uh, because these tools require data and computation, we, we also need to think about the infrastructure. We, think about, we need to think about the computation and the data um, sources that are needed um, to, to make these tools work. And so if we had the right uh, infrastructure we, um, and we got these tools to work, we still had some challenges uh, to think about. Um, in particular, data availability. I'm not, I'm not going to insist uh, too much on this because we had a whole session uh, that talked about uh, data, but it's really primarily that models require massive data sets that need to be manually uh, labeled. Also, the data has to be of high quality. If there is bias in the data, the performance of the AI solution will be equally biased. So bad data means bad performance. How do we get the right data, the good data, certifiable good data into our systems. Uh, another challenge uh, is, has to do with the fact that the models that we're creating are absolutely huge. Uh, they usually consist uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and uh, sometimes even more uh, uh, neurons. And as a result, these models seem to do the right thing, but they're black boxes. We cannot really explain how they reach the decisions that they reach, uh, which, is, um, which is a problem, especially in safety critical applications, uh, in applications that have to do uh, with, with health. Um, this, uh, the systems are not robust. Uh, they, they are quite brittle in how they function. And um, it's also important to understand that when we talk about AI and we talk about things like deep neural networks, we actually don't get uh, deep um, uh, processing. We mostly get pattern matching. Um, so we don't really get uh, semantics. So for instance, I could have a perfect translation from what I'm telling you in uh, English now into French. Um, and um, so lexically, this would look perfect. But the system doing this translation has no idea what I say. And so this is the kind of way in which you should think about uh, AI. Now, so this, does this mean we are doomed? Uh, well, no, it does not. And in fact, meetings like this one help us come together uh, to decide uh, what are the most important questions to ask and how do we, um, and how do we actually uh, work together between technologists, between AI practitioners, uh, between uh, policymakers, between the legal profession to, to really make progress. But some of the solutions could be technological. And um, so I just want to give you uh, a couple of examples uh, of how we are making progress, even with these, um, even with these challenges. Um, and um, so the first example I want to show you is on bias. And um, it's a very quick visual example. So um, it is well known that uh, AI systems struggle, um, especially on, uh, on faces, um, and they struggle with recognizing uh, different um, races. But what we can do is we can examine the underlying set of features in the data. Uh, we call this the latent structure. We can see what is, um, how it's uh, distributed. We can see what is overrepresented, what is underrepresented, and then we can resample to get a uh, debiased uh, um, or a less uh, or, or a more representative data set. Um, so this is intuitively one technological solution that can tackle um, biasing. I want to give you another quick technological solution for thinking about privacy, which is something very important we should all worry about, we should all think about. Um, and uh, I just want to show you an example from our research on, um, let's say you have a database. Uh, in fact, this one is the, uh, the Wisconsin Di Diagnostic Breast Cancer Dataset. 
and you, uh, we want um, to classify a new tumor with no information leakage, how can we do it? Well, a traditional solution um, might be to do something like a K-nearest neighbor classifier um, where we, um, we have the query and then we look at um, whether we have uh, more of one type or more of the other type data sets. And then we just say um, uh, whichever K um, type is closest, that's the type of the tumor. Uh, well, this is, uh, I mean, this would re this solution would reveal privacy, but it turns out we can solve this problem in a very interesting way. We can solve this problem by doing all the computations on encrypted data without decrypting anything. Um, so in computer science, this is called homomorphic encryption, and it stands for the idea that you can compute without decrypting uh, data. Now, homomorphic encryption is a new field. Uh, it has its own limitations. For instance, we cannot do division. Uh, uh, if we have two data, uh, two, two, uh, data items uh, that are encrypted. But we can do a lot of things, including this kind of, um, uh, this kind of unsupervised machine learning uh, that, uh, that does clustering. So um, here is another example of, um, of a technological idea that is moving the field forward uh, from the point of view of tackling some of the limitations uh, with the field. The last example I want to show you is on certification and auditing. And here I don't have an example from uh, medicine, uh, but I do have an intuitive example from autonomous driving. And what you see in this video uh, is a car, an autonomous vehicle. Uh, you see the map of the vehicle in the lower right corner of the picture. You see the camera input stream at the top uh, left. And at the bottom left, you see um, the attention map. That means where in the, in the image is the machine learning system looking? to make decisions whether the car should steer left or right in order to stay in lane. And the decision is made by this big rectangular box with blinking yellow and green lights. There are over 100,000 deep um, neural network neurons uh, in this box, and it is impossible to, to, make a, to correlate uh, the, the patterns in the box with what the vehicle does. So in other words, the, the, this thing seems to do the right thing, but we don't have any idea why. And it's, it's very difficult to do so. And moreover, if you look at the attention map, you see that it's all over the place, uh, right? I mean, the system is looking at bushes and it's mostly looking at context instead of looking at the task. So this is a significant uh, limitation with all deep uh, neural network systems. So what can we do about this? Well, we can come up with new ideas and I don't have time to explain what these ideas are, but here is another kind of a neuron and the kind of, uh, another kind of wiring and now look at the attention map. It's focused on the, road, uh, on the road horizon and on the sides of the road, which is what we do when we drive. And um, the network itself consists only of, of uh, 19 nodes. And from these 19 nodes, we can extract a decision tree, um, thereby uh, explaining exactly how the system makes decisions. These are the kinds of ideas that are needed to be advanced and then to be adopted in fields like in, in safety critical fields like um, medicine and also um, uh, driving. And, uh, and so I'm very excited about the potential and I'm very excited to discuss uh, with my preeminent panelists about uh, how AI challenges can be met and uh, tackled by, um, by, by technology, by policymakers and uh, by, uh, by uh, the field. And so uh, in the session, we have uh, five speakers, and the order of the speakers is Michel, uh, Michel Dumontier, Distinguished Professor at Maastricht University. Uh, following Michel, we will have Corinne Collignon uh, from the National Authority of uh, Health. Uh, then we will have Farhad Nezami from Harvard Medical School. We will have Marc Julien from uh, Diable Loop. And then we will have Nancy Miller Rich uh, from uh, Biotherics. And so after, after each of them um, uh, introduces their view of the problem, uh, we will have a conversation amongst ourselves, and then we will open it for discussion with you and everyone else online. So if you agree that this is a good way forward, uh, let us dive in. So Michelle, you're up. I think the slides will come from, um, from our Wonderful technicians who are um, okay. 
Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, okay, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And uh, great to see the, the previous session. Um, and in fact, I think of some of my comments are going to touch on this. There are really three, um, three challenges that I want to focus on in my, my comments. The first is access to high quality data. The second is trustworthy models. And the third is proper regulation. So Leo's talk on MIMIC was an important one. There is a growing number of these biobanks uh, and other open data sets that are being made available. And clearly these are important for the advancement of science and also to verify the work that people are doing. Um, one of the things that we have been working on are the so-called FAIR principles. Uh, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And these principles have laid a foundation for data sharing and data access by the funders like NIH, uh, the European Commission, and have been endorsed by the G20, and the G, uh, G8, and many other organizations. And part of what the FAIR principles are about are uh, the definition and adoption of standards for data and metadata, um, the use of data portals and their sustainability in the long term, and really the enhancement of access to data uh, by regular people, by scientists and others that want to do investigations. Uh, and this needs to be facilitated. And this is particularly onerous in the context of human personal data, where there are restrictions on uh, what are, are made available and what we can do with them. And we really need that to be facilitated. For now, many of my students they, uh, you know, that uh, are working with personal health data, it can take up to a year and a half or two years to get access to data to do some kind of scientific work. This is a clear barrier to our progress. The second is that we need diverse data. So we primarily have been working with electronic healthcare record data, uh, biobank data, but now there are many other data sources, right? There are Fitbits that provide information about individual activities. Um, there are longitudinal health records that are compiled from both the, the, the care practitioner in an outpatient setting, as well as inpatient and hospitals. Um, and there are other kinds of consumer health data that can uh, reveal information about the lifestyle and the activities of individuals. And we need to be able to bring these data together in an integrated fashion um, so that we can ask questions and build models uh, from them. And uh, these need to be integrated from many different uh, organizations across the globe with different languages. This is particularly onerous here in Europe. We have uh, you know, 30 plus uh, official languages. Um, and uh, the records and the data are all in different, uh, in different languages. So we obviously need to be able to integrate data across borders if we are gonna learn something, learn models that are generally applicable to uh, different kinds of populations. Then finally, these data need to be uh, up to date uh, and uh, they need to be correct. And there are many cases where data, so take the context of hospital data, People come in, there's an acute condition, they have a heart attack, they come in uh, in emergency care, and we may never see them again. Uh, and this is the snapshot of data that we have about them. They may be prescribed a medication, but they may, may not have even taken the medication. We often don't even know what the outcome is. Did they survive or did they pass away? Um, these kinds of information we need to keep up to date. Uh, we need physicians that are also verifying this, but we also need patients to be able to correct and uh, ameliorate their, uh, their, their health records. Uh, we have a new project, a Horizon Europe project called IDEVA, uh, which is AI-powered data curation and virtual assistant. Um, this has just kicked off this month. And our goal there is to use uh, AI technologies to facilitate this data curation and improvement and having patients in the loop as well as physicians. So their goal is to build these personal health records that are usable in a clinical research context, but also eventually in a clinical care context. The second part is about trustworthy models. Now, this is a big issue, is that we are building a lot of models and deploying them in many circumstances without necessarily knowing what their limitations are. It's really important that these models are well studied, that not only do we understand how they perform in general, with the average case, the average individual, but also where they are failing, uh, which populations are not benefiting or which populations are getting uh, incorrect uh, diagnoses or prognoses or um, prediction of therapeutic responses. 
It's important that these models improve clinical decision-making. Um, they need to provide insight beyond what physician teams can already do. Uh, this is not useful if you sort of, uh, you know, somebody comes in with a, a, a cough and it says you have a cold. Well, fine. I mean, this is easy to diagnose. What is hard to diagnose is the set of people who walk through the healthcare system for 20 plus years and have no diagnosis. These are the really hard cases, and this is really where we need to bring data to bear. Um, we also need to include a broader uh, scope. So more than just clinical trials, we need the uh, data that uh, deal with multi multi-morbid populations. They are working with incomplete or erroneous data. They are also working in different healthcare settings. Uh, they need to work not only in Europe, in you know, very uh, well-developed uh, clinical theaters, but also in low and medium income countries where they might not have access to imaging facilities or to other uh, even follow-up facilities. Uh, the data and the models need to be transparent. Uh, we heard a little bit about open data, but we also need the algorithms and the software to be open access and to be interrogable by others, uh, by researchers, and it need to be proven to be uh, robust in the face of, uh, of various uh, challenges. And then finally, the last point is a bit about proper regulation. And I use this, um, well, proper or sensible regulation because we can go crazy on regulation. And I am a Canadian uh, who has moved to the Netherlands uh, and I've learned about regulation a lot in Europe and it has its role but it's also important that it's sensible, that it is balanced, and it balances the needs not only of individuals and their specific objectives, but also the responsibilities of those that hold those data and process them. I think things like the GDPR are a good step to recognize that there needs to be some special attention to data and to data rights. But there is a broader discussion that also needs to, be, to happen about the, the public's um, uh, benefit of having access to data. A good example of this is imagine we built um, models that were with people who consented to provide their data to the model, but then there are all these people who did not consent to providing their data. These data are now not in the model. And that means when they show up for an AI decision-making process, it may be a misclassification or a misdiagnosis or a misprognosis. And so we really have to think that actually, if we're gonna go in this direction of including AI, in the context of medicine, we need the representative population to be in the model uh, building and also of the testing. Otherwise, we are fooling ourselves that they are generally applicable and will benefit the, the, the total population. The other last point perhaps is that these models need to be resilient in the face of models that change with time. Our AI models are not uh, build a product like an iPhone or a Samsung and ship it out to some specification, but they are changing with the data that we incorporate. Their decisions that they make will be different tomorrow than they were today. So how do we regulate such a system that is changing with time and changing with the data that it's exposed to? Well, we have a project proposal, uh, also a Horizon Europe project that we hope will uh, uh, be finalized. And it will be about creating a regulatory sandbox by which we have multiple stakeholders, including the regulators, the development of application, application developers, uh, companies, and other um, data intermediaries, and to come together and think about what sensible regulation is required for these kinds of models in the context of uh, medicine and healthcare. Yeah, thank you. So that, that was really, uh, really amazing, Michelle. And, uh... Uh, sorry, that was really amazing, Michelle. And uh, we have a clear um, uh, example here of how technology helps to keep us all connected. But then we also have a little technological glitch that has uh, prevented us from, uh, from showing Michelle's um, slides. But uh, you, um, uh, you're amazing, even without slides, and so clear. I want to ask you, um, what is the role of FAIR um, data uh, in AI in medicine. And so you touched upon it, but could you address uh, the specifics of FAIR for medicine? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I alluded a little bit to, you know, projects like uh, Leo's M Mimic, uh, as well as other biobanks like the UK Biobank and FinGen and the work that's being done by the French Health Data Hub, right, to bring data sets uh, available to others to perform research, to build models, to validate their work. 
Um, the work of, of FAIR uh, is, is twofold. One is, is to make data available to others. That is the primary, one of the primary objectives, but it's also second objective is to absolutely ensure that these data are reusable. And uh, this is often not the case. So I see a lot of data graveyards, right? People create data sets, they put a lot of effort into it, they dump it into a portal, and we never know if they're used and they're never integratable with other data sets. Um, it's incumbent on us, especially in the context of artificial intelligence technologies, is to utilize as much data as is possible, representative individual population, uh, and individual data to build these models from all jurisdictions around the world. So the call to arms for FAIR is, is really to ask um, every country uh, to start thinking about how they can provide um, representative data of their population so that when we build these AI models, we are going to be able to utilize them accurately and reliably in those patient populations. And that the practitioners in those, uh, those organizations, they also feel confident that this will do, a, you know, this will be an accurate tool in their decision making uh, process. And that is, that is the idea with FAIR here. That's really amazing. So kind of a universal standard that uh, all countries would adopt and uh, that would make it possible for data to be interused across the globe. Yeah, that is the big challenge, right? Combining data sets is arguably one of the biggest problems um, in some of these model building. People uh, can easily build models from single data sets, but as soon as they try to combine them, it's very difficult. And the, the I in FAIR stands for interoperability. And uh, it means that we have to prepare these data in standards that are going to be accepted and utilized across the world. Uh, and that takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of ongoing efforts are, are there with uh, HL7 fire and many other terminologies and vocabularies in medicine and healthcare. And it's, it's important that we adhere to these standards. We ex extend them in the ways that our population needs them. But at the end of the day, those data are prepared in a manner that reduces the effort for uh, researchers, for um, innovators to, to incorporate and to utilize uh, that information. That's really great. I guess I'm just thinking a, a kind of a Vienna convention, which was, uh, uh, organized for traffic rules uh -huh. and now the traffic rules are are uniform across the globe so it's a kind of a vienna convention oh. for um for medicine maybe we can call it the maastricht convention yeah. or the paris convention yeah it's a great analogy okay so um let's see i have um uh corinne's presentation uh if the if do you have it upstairs no okay i will share the screen and i have corinne's presentation here you go corinne um, Thank you very much uh, for giving me the, the opportunity to share with all of you <laughs> the experience of the French, French National Authority for Health, uh, HIS in French, um, that is uh, specifically involved not in the development of AI technology, but in their assessment. Um, uh, it's um, its issue is to, to, to help the ministry. Uh, its main issue is to help the ministry to decide if they should be reimbursed or, or not. And more and more often, uh, the technologies uh, that we have to assess are based and will be more and more often based on, on AI. Sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, our global objective, um, uh, besides the assessment of the technology, is to facilitate uh, the, the integration of the, the, the relevant uh, digital uh, technologies into professional practices. Uh, of course, we have different missions, and in a few minutes, I can't say much about them. But I would insist on the youth potential of AI to improve the healthcare system and to transform also um, pathway in many therapeutic domains. Uh, and the key to guiding its introduction in healthcare is to develop the confidence of those users in AI. A lot of things have already been say, said uh, on data, so I, I, I won't uh, insist on that point, but it is crucial. Um, uh, I, I will focus on, on what uh, we have done and we are doing to, to build this trust uh, framework, actually. Um, in our assessment processes, we, we believe that it's not necessary to 
to, to open the black box. So to know a lot about the mathematical uh, model behind the technology, but uh, it is essential for a company to provide key information to users and of course to HTA bodies uh, in charge of ev evaluation to accelerate uh, the appropriation of these technologies. This is why we developed two years ago a specific framework dedicated to, to digital technologies integrating AI uh, to help to understand what is behind the AI term uh, each time a company sends to us a, do a dossier. Uh, it is agreed in, uh, with, uh, with 42 items uh, divided in four sections, uh, and it questions um, it, it questions data, the data used uh, for the learning, for the validation as well. But as you can see, uh, also the performance, the robustness, the resilience um, of the technology. Uh, there are many items, and uh, those are some example of uh, of. Uh, the, the key point uh, information what we target in our in our grid. This grid is a tool that we uh, we are we have built for our 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 news, but it's, it is public, and uh, anyone can 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 use it. Um, it is a it is a fact. Uh, AI can create fear in the users, whether they are uh, patients or professionals. And uh, anything we can do to build um, trust uh, will be helpful. But uh, we are honestly uh, very humble because our scope of assessment is um, a drop in the ocean in the ocean of technologies. Um, to be to be to be to be concrete, uh, 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 at, at, uh, actually, we assess mainly we mainly assess uh, technologies that are used by patients. Uh, and it's impossible to evaluate the benefit and the relevance of every healthcare technology incorporating AI. And it's not the objective to, of, of HAS to, to assess every single one of them because uh, we have to help their introduction, uh, not, to, not to freeze the innovation. And this is why we, we launched uh, a few weeks ago a work plan dedicated to digital medical devices used by uh, professionals because they are currently out of our scope of assessment. Uh, and um, the objective is to, to build the trust framework dedicated to such technologies in order to foster the integration of those that are relevant and innovative, and many of them are AI-based. So it is a large work, work plan that we recently launched. We will involve, of course, in this uh, work plan uh, stakeholders and, uh, of course, professionals and I and I hope that I can tell uh, you much about uh, much more about uh, about it in about this in a few months. But is um, it is our current. Uh... <laughs> 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 um, current topic. Uh... <laughs> well, well, and thank you. Corinne, th thank you so much. Uh, it's so exciting what you're building. Um, but can you tell us why is it not possible to set up a systematic evaluation of the benefit of AI-enabled software in your process? Uh, mainly due to the, to the volume of the technology to assess and the, the speed of the market. Uh, it won't be reasonable to, to think that we can assess uh, um, in a... In a uh, in a, in agenda uh, compatible with uh, the, the industrial market, uh, any any of that technologies, and there is still a regulation. There is a CO marking. There is a European regulation. Uh, what we uh, what we are trying to 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 to, to build is rather um, a positive uh, framework in order to to guide professionals to to choose. <laughs> In order to to guide professional to to choose, so uh, probably we will um, we will uh, produce uh, several tools uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, gen generic tools, and uh, and we will work uh, uh, with uh, professionals to 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 build a methodological guidance and new methods, new framework to to help them to 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 do their choice. So in a positive way, not in a, in a regulatory position. Got it. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, so uh, let's see, our next speaker uh, is Farad. And I believe that um, the, the team upstairs can uh, run his slides. So, sorry. Okay. Awesome. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, um, what I'm trying here to actually introduce is the angle that might be a little bit not familiar with the, with the audience. Uh, may, I, may I ask how many mechanical engineers we have here? Hands up. Uh, okay. I, all right. <laughs> nah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Elazar, you are more a clinician than, than a mechanical engineer. So, that's what I'm talking about. I, I'm the only one here. And I, I can discuss mechanical engineer. We are talking about mechanical, not computer science. So uh, that's 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 actually the, the 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 issue in the in the medical device industry, where we are not appreciating enough in the preclinical procedure what should have been done well in advance before the bad results and and uh, and, and terrible outcome comes. And then we come back to mechanical engineers trying to figure out. Uh, what went wrong, and the majority of cases, that's a mechanical issue uh, that, that 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 we need to address. So, let me see if I can. Can we move on? It would be much easier if I share. I can do that. I'm just trying to see if I can move to the next slide. You can say next slide. Yep. Awesome. And uh, full screen would help. Thank you. All right. We will move on. Probably the videos will not be not show if you don't go to the full screen. That's what I was trying to do. And uh, if you allow me to share, it might be even easier to, for me to proceed and point to the insets, maybe. So as long as you can see what's going on here, uh, we engineers, we're trying to leverage the classical concepts of mechanics and try to apply it to different applications in terms of uh, diagnostics, understanding of what's going on with the diseases, and try to leverage those understandings towards therapy planning and even uh, medical device. So I, I've, I've tried to show you three, two different aspects of the research we do at MIT and Harvard. Um, here, we are talking about computational physiology, meaning that uh, let me understand what goes wrong as a pathology. For instance, if we are doing, if you see the top left corner, um, the wall shear stress analysis can be uh, kind of digged to uh, appreciate the pathogenesis and, and where the atherogenesis is happening, where the clots are happening, are co-locating with the areas of low wall shear stress, right? That's as simple as it is, but it's very informative when it comes to uh, characterize the patients who are more susceptible uh, and more atheroprone than the others or the locations in the, in the, in the, in the anatomy. Same goes with the um, risk stratification for the lesions. So um, if we appreciate the mechanical stress and we uh, extract the micromorphology from um, image processing, that's where AI can help. And then we connect that micromechanics to uh, micromorphology to micromechanics, we are actually being able to attribute later on the outcomes to those concepts of micromechanics. So I can say it is not the volume of the calcium which plays a role. It is the stress that calcium is inducing in the coronary artery, which leads to the, to the yeah, that's, that's what I should have done from the beginning. Um, but, so 
AI helps. So we are extracting information that would be cumbersome and timely if you wanted to do it uh, and costly if you if, if wanted to do it manually. For instance, when you are appreciating the different compartments of the, of the, of the, of the coronary lesion, where the calcium and lipid are and how they interplay, it is much easier if you do it automatically for a patient specific cases. Um, we leverage different concepts, so and it has different type of applications. Congenital heart disease, where the cases are so limited that uh, it is much more appreciated if we add to the pool of the data available to the to the to the me medical team, and that's where you appreciate, for instance, here for bicuspital aortic valves or for uh, coarctation patients, uh, how the flow is disrupted with the pathology. Moving on. Uh, uh, mechanical devices uh, and, and, and implants, endovascular implants, that, that's where actually the most efficient application of the mechanical engineering and modeling can come to play a role. You can see a lot of different representatives here coming from the stents, mechanical uh, analysis of the stents, drug delivery in the stents that we can use mechanistic uh, models to actually uh, predict and appreciate it. Um, Prostatic surgery and prosthetic valves when it comes to vascular surgery and uh, structural surgery for cardiac surgery. And nowadays, mechanical support systems, we move on to artificial hearts where the uh, availability of transplants are so limited that we are thinking of, of, of cases that we used to use as a uh, bridge to therapy now as a destination therapy tools. And for that, we are, still do not appreciate the interaction between the device and the, and the, and the uh, biology and, 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 and physiology. And these tools, because of the complexity of the nature of these problems, is what we are going to leverage. And ultimately, that's where I see myself. Like, I'm trying to wear a tie because that I, that I need in the hospital to squeeze myself between the interventional cardiologists and surgeons trying to offer what I am building as a mechanical engineering or engineering in general tools and I'm hoping that those tools would be adopted in cath labs, in, in ORs, and in the therapy planning for those patients where we can have a better diagnostic, better risk stratification, uh, much educated approaches for surgery planning, and as well for the design and development and selection of the devices for the application in, 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 in clinical uh, medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Farhad. Sure. The, the, those devices are, are really... Um, thank you, Farhad. The, the devices you have shown are, are really extraordinary. It's, uh, it's so magical to think about little robotic things implanted that, that help us um, uh, live better. I wanted to ask you, uh, there has been a rising interest in the in silico clinical trials for um, emerging devices. Can you elaborate a bit and uh, let us know how AI may contribute to these attempts. Sure, um, this, is, this is the problem. Clinical trials uh, need to be updated and evolved. So I, I use a quote from a great friend of mine, Alex Frangi in, in Leeds, who, who made the analogy between the car industry and uh, clinical trials. When you, you look at BMWs in 30 years, I don't get any money from them. To advertise, but you can see quite a evolution from what the car used to look like 30 years ago and what it looks like now. But when you go to the factory site, you still see the same evolution. We no longer use wind tunnels to check the flow around the uh, car. We, we, we nowadays use CFD for that, right? But do we really do the same with the, with the medical device? We don't. We still stick to the regular patient recruitment and then follow-ups and then post-market surveys and stuff. And that's where in silico clinical trials can play a role. So what, what in silico clinical trials offer, and modestly US is a little bit ahead of the game than Europe on this, is actually to use computational models to refine and reduce the clinical trial costs and burden. So if we are talking about the medical device, if we are talking about the new stent, and there might be alternatives for prototyping. Nowadays, R&Ds are doing prototyping on computers, but they don't do the permutations of testing those devices using in silico clinical trials. So you can actually design the entire device, go through the entire procedure of clinical trial as if you are doing it within your computers, 
there, there are two approaches to take. One is digital twins. We have talked a lot about digital twins, but that needs a prerequisite of building digital twin based on a retrospective clinical trial. You need to have a trial to build a digital model of it. But there is a newer approach where you actually leverage those information and use AI and with generative methods, you build a population, a digital population that does not exist. So you don't necessarily need to have one-to-one -one correspondence between those cases that you are building and, and a patient. You can build a hypothetical patient that doesn't exist out there. And that's actually appreciable. Why? Because first, you have the diversity, much more than you can have in your clinical trials. We are human and we are associated with bias. And another thing is that you can think of options and permutations that might actually happen in real cases post-market, but not in your clinical trials. So those are the options Thank that you. clinical trials can offer you. Thank you, Farhad. So uh, we have uh, two more speakers to hear from, to, to hear their perspectives. And, uh, and then we will have a discussion with all of us and with you. Um, so Farhad, can you... Uh, project Mark's um, presentation. So next we have Mark Julien from uh, Diabloop. Hi, good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Mark Julien, I'm uh, co-CEO uh, of, uh, of Diabloop, and it's an honor to be here presenting a solution to, uh, to this noble academy. Uh, to, okay, yeah, thank you. To this noble academy. Um, so what we do, um, and, and I'm not going to be, um, okay, oh, sorry, next one, one. I'm not going to be explaining to you all what's diabetes because I, I'm assuming that uh, a lot of you already know, but you need to remember that diabetes has two main aspects of it. One is the treatment of diabetes, meaning that a patient uh, needs to make the right calculation at the right time for the amount of insulin that he needs to or she needs to inject to herself or himself. And the second time is they have to think about it all the time. And when I'm saying all the time, it means day in, day out. And they basically take 100 decisions per day. Um, when we go and, and because I'm French, I'm going to buy the, the, the la baguette. Um, you know, whether I take the bike, whether I walk, whether I take the train, for me, it's a non-issue. Um, the, the car, sorry, it's a non-issue. But for a patient with diabetes, it could be an issue. And they have to decide which of the three, you know, need, you know, uh, transportation system they're going to use. And so what we are developing within Jabloop is um, a system that personalizes and optimize the, uh, the treatment for patients with diabetes. Um, we started with the uh, uh, a type one um, um, patients uh, using pumps, and it's the product you see um, on on the right here. Um, so the, the way it works is that we capture um, every five minutes the glycemia of the patient through um, a sensor, um, namely um, either the the one from Abbott or the one from Dexcom. There's only two on the market really today that um, we can use, and um, with that information. We calculate, and I will explain you how, um, how much insulin the patient needs at that specific time. And automatically, the system, which is today um, on a handheld uh, device that looks like a telephone, but you know it is a telephone, actually, um, and tomorrow it will be an app, um, give the order automatically to the pump, to the insulin pump, to deliver that, that um, insulin. So it's a fully automated solution uh, where actually the patient doesn't need to do first thing I mentioned, which is to calculate how much insulin he or she needs. That's done by the system. And the second one is to think about it because the system does that for them. Um, so that's the first product that we have, which is C-marked, um, and it's currently reimbursed in a number of countries. The second product we've developed is a telemedicine solution where um, the patient can actually look at what's going on um, and and what's the past, uh, what was the past, um, look at the glycemia level, um, how well uh, the system have managed their glycemia. Uh, obviously, this is uh, personal medical data, and therefore, if she or he wants to share it with somebody, either it's family, loved ones, whoever, or with the caregivers, 
you will have to open the system to to the to those people. Most of the time, I'd say ninety percent of the time, and um, you know they, they do do open that to the caregivers. Not all, but most. Um, and so the doctor actually can look at the data, uh, review this data before the meeting with the uh, with the patient, and then discuss the uh, the results of the the last months, three months, six months of uh, treatment, and see whether there is any thing that needs to be adjusted, or actually to just uh, continue um, and and run like that. So that product is also C marked and is also on the market today, and is actually uh, used also by by all the patients and doctors. The technology we've used for the pump, um, the algorithm and the AI that we are using currently for the pump, we've decided to uh, move it to an app for patients that are currently using pens. Um, the, the issue, of course, is that the pump is very expensive. Not everybody can actually access a pump, and so um, and also not all, in all countries. So we wanted to uh, allow patients to access uh, that technology, even if it wasn't fully automated, but at least somewhat automated, with people using pens. So um, the system is the same as the previous one. Um, the only thing is that the order to deliver the insulin is, is of course, given to the patient and not okay, uh, not to the uh, not to the um, uh, not not to the system. Uh, and the patient will have to, um, you know, inject him, him or herself the, uh, the, the, the insulin. Um, so how it works? Um, um, so it, it's it's a uh, it's a truly black box solution, as um, as you were saying. Um, so first is safety. Um, um, we check that the patient is not going to be in a situation where he or she might have a problem. So we check that. And once that's checked, um, we actually use um, two steps of algorithm to make sure that we're not making any mistakes because we know sometimes intelligent, artificial intelligence makes mistake. And, and so we, we prevent that with the supervisor that we have patented. And then the system learns on the patient as the patient uses it, not the algorithm, but the parameters that will go into the, uh, the algorithm. Uh, we store that on the, uh, the handset and we analyze that every month, every two months. We actually look at the data and check whether there is any adjustment to the parameters that need to be made so that the response is really personalized. And you can imagine, for example, for women, um, there are some, you know, a, you know um, a menstrual cycle that needs to be taken care of. And, and so the system will look at that. We'll detect that and then we'll be able to adjust the uh, delivery of insulin um, to that purpose. We, we actually have models and simulators um, uh, in, in our labs um, that are um, where we test our, our algorithm. Um, we test uh, not only the new algorithm on it, but also the extremes so that we don't put the patients um, at risk. And we have simulators for patients with type 1 and type 2, which are the, the next um, population we want to address. So how, how successful we are, but we're being extremely successful. Um, we have launched our product uh, in 2021. Um, we've got today more than 10,500 10, patients using the system across uh, seven countries in Europe. Um, and the drop rate um, that uh, we uh, look at um, is less than 1%, is about 1%, which is extremely low. Um, um, and in terms of results, well, we actually have done an analysis of a quarter of 4,500 above uh, patients that we actually presented uh, two weeks ago at one of our major congress in, um, in diabetology. We confirmed the results that we had in clinical trials, and we actually even improved the time in a hypoglycemia, which is one of the key parameters that we look at. Um, and we are three times lower than what um, the norm is, is expected. Um, without further ado, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me, and then I'll pass on. The... We're getting to turn this on. Thank you, Mark. Um, your device is extraordinary, and uh, it, it's really remarkable that you can um, you can run um, complex AI systems on such a, a tiny edge device. That is a, a, a true success. Can you tell us? Um, how did you, what, what is the secret sauce for putting this on the market? 
briefly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so the the I think the secret is first that um, in France we we have an ecosystem that is unique in the world, um, um, and and I, I, I tend to call that le génie français. Um, where we can uh, bring together uh, doctors that are top-notch um, technology, uh, uh, you know, centers uh, like the CERA, with whom we have a, a partnership, and and also the support of the uh, of the uh, public administration and the financing. And and um, you know, again, I'd like to thank uh, BHS for for the help. Um, in in less than than five years, we were able to develop the system, test it. Uh, get the C marking and and get the uh, reimbursement from the uh, from the French authorities. Um, so the first one is is really putting all together those uh, those three elements. Um, first, the 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 number one is that we have put the patient at the center of everything that we do, um, and and so we've got patients since the very beginning uh, to help us. Um, think through the system and make sure that what we were doing would help them and the doctors. And um, and so that was uh, extremely important. And the last but not least, um, our organization is extremely agile. So we, since the very beginning, we, we've uh, organized our company to be um, agile and meaning that every time we need to change or switch or um, adapt ourselves to the changes of the conditions, we, we would do that. Um, especially with uh, regulation evolving with uh, you know um, the requirements of the, uh, the authorities um, um, you know, being, becoming more and more uh, stringent, we we had to uh, we had to, to to be very agile. Thank you, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and uh, so let's hear from our um, speaker in uh, New Jersey, Nancy Miller Rich. Uh, Nancy, please take it away. Nancy, you're muted. Can somebody unmute Nancy? Upstairs. And Nancy, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yes, please oh, go ahead. Terrific. That's great. So uh, thank you for the uh, for the time. It's a it's an interesting time for our industry, and uh, I very much wish that I could have uh, been there with you uh, today. Unfortunately, I have caught COVID, so uh, I think you'd probably actually like it more if I if I stay where I am. Um, so let me get my screen up here. Okay, so um, I've spent 35 years uh, at Sterling Drug, Sandoz, now Novartis, Shearing Plow, and uh, Merck. I am also uh, sit on or have saw, sat on about seven biotech boards. Um, I've also led the digital transformation for some very large, some of the largest um, uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world. And um, all of them are using AI and uh, machine learning in some manner in very, in, in very kind of small, uh, narrow ways. I wanna go through, uh, through with you a little bit about um, kind of what I see as some of the challenges. And then I will at the end talk a little bit where I th think the opportunities uh, are. And so, you know, right now, pharma companies are, you know, they're hundreds of years old. And what has happened is they've been acquired companies over time. And so they've all got these separate systems and bolt-ons that, uh, you know, oftentimes the data doesn't even uh, speak to each other. And so it just becomes an assorted group of parts. Uh, so what you basically have is siloed systems. You've got culturally uh, siloed divisions and that is siloed people and the data then just sits in kind of narrow pools. Um, I had, as I said, I, I led the digital transformation for a major pharmaceutical company and even getting alignment on what digital transformation meant was really, really difficult. And even if you got it through one silo division, you, it wasn't embraced by the entire division. And what became clear to me is that there are really no digitally na native pharma companies. Uh, and so one of the things that I first did is I went around to the Amazons of the world, uh, American Express, uh, some of the largest advertising agencies, because I knew that they were using AI and machine learning in a totally different way. And so trying to take what they were doing, you know, they were doing real-time uh, micro-moment marketing to the masses. 
and trying to understand how could we do and implement some of those some of those things. Um, but again, trying to get alignment on the definition was really difficult. Some people saw it just as a website. You know, some people saw it as a, a better way to service our customers. Um, others saw it as a way to kind of beef up some of our capabilities. Maybe it was end-to-end -end manufacturing processes. You know, what I was really pushing for, and, and, you know, maybe this is trying to run before you can walk, but how do your data systems feed into your circulatory system where all of your decisions become data informed? And that's where really I thought the, uh, the big win was. And also then to democratize that data so anybody can access it and we all have the same truth in front of us. Um, you know, I talked about silos and they were, they're very real. You know, when you've got a employee, uh, employee base of 120,000 people, you can understand how you've got siloed. Uh, and so, you know, you would have R&D in one silo, you would have manufacturing, finance, commercial, but then if you multiply that by every country in the world and every region, you can see how you would have just all these pockets of, of data. You know, the interesting thing was though, as siloed as we were, uh, one of those companies got hit with malware and all of a sudden there were no silos. It ate through everything. And it also ate through even to our customers as well. And so, you know, it's interesting uh, not being, having old technology, uh, you know, what it, what it can do. You know, what we basically had was outdated technology and our systems were so vulnerable. It impacted R&D, it impacted manufacturing, you know, it, it ate into the, the GMP, the good manufacturing practices, everything that we had. You know, the other thing I found was there was a real uh, conundrum as it came to culture. And I've heard that talked about a little bit uh, in the previous discussion, but you know, in, in, uh, in pharma, you've got PhD, MDs, very conservative, slow, uh, old, bureaucratic, and risk-taking is, is frowned upon mostly. Uh, compliance is a top priority. And the FDA, the ruling regulatory body in the US, pretty much the same. If you look at some of the AI and machine learning executives that I worked with, or I went when I met with those digitally native companies, it was a totally different culture. It was, you know, maybe PhD, aggressive, fast, young, risk-taking reward, uh, was rewarded. When I would bring Amazon and a Merck together, it was like we were speaking two totally different languages. Uh, you know, Amazon would say you have to, you know, no meeting can be bigger than what can feed one pizza and big pharma might bring 30 people. And so it was such a difference in culture. Um, and I don't think that there was necessarily, uh, you know, different athletes and, and respecting the different things that different parties brought, brought to, the, uh, to the equation. You know, the other thing that I've noticed is um, I used to head business development and the, we used to say the first time no is hit or a stop sign, that's when really the innovation begins. And I believe that's the same thing in, in pharma or pretty much in any industry. Um, but, you know, oftentimes there's hundreds of stop signs in, in drug development. Um, uh, human biology and chemistry is complex. The whole development path is complex. Um, and I would say in R&D, sometimes you can iterate a uh, you know, around if you get the um, alignment of the, you know, R&D and the, and the uh, corporate organization. But I would say broadly in pharma, things have to be perfect before release. And some of the things that I started seeing was, you know, if we're looking at patient adherence programs, it had to be perfect before it was released. We couldn't release a, uh, a beta version and then iterate to make it better and better and better. And that seemed to, you know, uh, I think limit kind of understanding the usability of, of some of these uh, techniques. The other thing that I noticed was a uh, trust. I'll use it as trust from a, fa a physician patient standpoint and validation slash trust from a corporate standpoint. You know, I do think that AI and machine learning, uh, if it interrupts the physician patient uh, relationship, that's gonna be a problem. However, you know, what we've gone to now, at least in the US is many times 
the physicians are sitting there uh, in front of their computers taking uh, information down, not even looking at the patient, and that's problematic as well. Um, the other thing as it relates to validation is big pharma, before they uh, want to put money down on something, they want to see that it's 100% validated. Well, you know, that's that's quite difficult as you're trying to do some of these things that have uh, never been done before. One minute, other, Nancy. I'm sorry? One minute. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, the other, we've talked about this before, but that, uh, you know, the black box, black box aspect of AI can be problematic as well. It's a, a little bit of a, as I think about mechanism of action, we don't know the mechanism of action of all of our drugs. You want to know that, but you don't know it. But I think that that also uh, impacts the validation and the lack of trust from big pharma in doing some of these, uh, in some of these, uh, this work. You know, all of that, I kind of paint a pretty uh, dim picture, but I really believe that whoever can embrace AI and machine learning in pharma and biotech has the potential to solve some of our biggest healthcare issues uh, and disease questions in the world. Uh, you know, right now, drug development is really uh, the function of persistence and serendipity. Uh, you know, some of the biggest drugs in the world were serendipitous, uh, you know, finds. And the other thing is when you think there's about, they claim there's 10,000 disease and 500 drugs, I would argue there's a lot more disease because um, we are lumping disease into one big area, lung cancer, let's say. And lung cancer can be split out into a thousand different subsets of diagnoses with all a different mutational profile. And so right now, the tools that we have are grossly inadequate, um, and they're basically kind of blunt, broad instruments that really don't understand the, the or be able to probe into kind of the specific patient and the mutational profile of that disease in that patient. Uh, on top of all that, I said drug development path is, is really complex. You have to have biologic understanding, translational target, you know, ID, uh, compound libraries, lead optimization, you know, all, all kinds of uh, different areas. What I what I have seen is AI and machine learning companies start taking narrow pieces of that to uh, to implement a change. So uh, you know, one company, uh, uh, Biotherics, actually that I'm on the board of, we have um, we've taken a peptide and put a, a radio tracer into it, and so that we can um, and then the patient ingest it. And we can then uh, look at where that disease is in the body. Previously, it had been thought that it only attacks one major organ. And now what we find is the 360 impact and the five organ impact that it has. And at the same time, then, as we give a drug, we can then see the diminishment or not of that disease. Um, you know, so right now we have limited uh, uh, you know, understanding of this rare disease. And as you get this data set more and more and more, then you can now start applying uh, artificial intelligence to understand when a patient looks like this and they get this drug, what is their projected outcome? Um, you know, the other thing is, um, I said there's you know 500, even if you take that broad number, that's 5% of all the diseases we are uh, able to, to treat. Uh, in AI and machine learning, hopefully we'll be able to let us go to a place that we can't now. Uh, one of the companies uh, that I'm a, a founder and advisor to, uh, 1063, uh, and, and the name shouldn't, uh, is meant to be meaningful, it's 10 to the 63rd power. And so we're taking the, uh, a crystal structure of a dis known, uh, well-known undruggable disease and then we are doing analyses, aspirational analyses of 10 to the 63rd power to find those um, specific drugs that uh, um, can, can basically bind uh, to, that, to that crystal structure. And then we can actually try to even game the disease to see how it's going to uh, mutate around the, uh, 
the, the compound. And so I have a, um, you know, a lot of hope for the future. There are, uh, I would say that nobody has really, you know, obviously cracked the code, even on some of these narrow areas. Um, but uh, I do think that we're getting, the amount of discovery time is getting uh, reduced more and more and more. Uh, in the company that I just talked about, 1063, um, they were able to create a drug for an undruggable target uh, that has been studied for 40 years. Uh, that was um, a thousand times better than anything that's been uh, developed previously. That said, it is not a perfect compound yet. But what that does is it the, the launching ground from where you now start human optimization is so much further down the road. So I have a lot of hope. Uh, obviously, we've got a lot of challenges though in front of us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. So um, we, uh, I'm, I was so excited to hear about the multitude of opinions here. We have business, we have engineering, uh, we have innovation, we have regulation, um, we have policy, we have technology, we have uh, technical um, AI uh, ideas that we've discussed. I, um, let me pose my first question to the panelists and um, I'd like to hear your respective perspectives on the following question. Technology in AI is advancing so fast and regulation is so slow. So how can we have safe products without killing innovation? Michel. Sure, I mean, this is, the, this is the question of the day, isn't it? I mean, we're all struggling to figure it out. Uh, and we have authorities that are established ex ex uh, expressively to address this. I mean, from my perspective, I think there, you know, it's more um, a benchmarking and uh, having, you know, again, a sort of a standard that we can apply in a recurrent and low uh, cost uh, setting, right? So the idea is incremental advancements and we need to, um, to, to see how well these work uh, as they are being improved actively with a lower barrier for reapproval. Um, and I think that this would be one, one part of the solution. The other part I think is that the regulatory agency also would benefit from having experts and expertise within house uh, to understand the technical aspects of these technologies in order to formulate the right set of questions and to get answers that are satisfying uh, to the regulatory agency and can be justified uh, when actions are taken uh, and or rules are set down. Well, Mark, what's your opinion? Business, now it's time for business to respond. Um, I, I, um, I, think, I think we um, regulation, regulation needs to adapt to the, the pace of technology. Um, and if it doesn't, um, the patient won't won't wait for it, um, and and I, I I tend to say, uh, remember that uh, when the taxi um, put too much regulation, uh, Uber started. Uh, when the hotel industry put too much regulation, uh, Airbnb started. And people tell me, well, yes, but in med tech that doesn't happen. Well, actually, it does. Um, uh, in diabetes, in, in diabetes, um, there's a thousands of patients that are actually currently downloading open source solution to automate the treatment uh, like the one we have because regulation and payers are not fast enough to process the uh, the application of our solution and 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 the other th the other thing i'm i'm thinking of is that if europe is not going fast enough there's going to be other countries that will go where europe doesn't want to go and um the uh, we will have products that will be regulated and imposed upon us that doesn't respect what we European believe should be, but because we have lost the the, the you know the war with them, uh, because regulation was too stringent and not adapted enough, then we won't be able to understand what they do and they impose on us things that we don't want to be uh, imposed on. So I really believe we need to adjust, adapt, and make regulation. Uh, uh, much faster to uh, the um, to, to the changes of technology. Nancy, uh, you have a lot of experience uh, getting um, uh, new new drugs and devices approved uh, at the FDA. What's the American perspective from this point of view? 
So I would say it's unfair to just pick on the regulatory systems because quite honestly, if we could uh, have better uh, AI and translational medicine or how to run clinical trials more effectively, that would just speed up when you could file your dossier to that regulatory agency. It's interesting because with some divisions of the regulatory agencies, I find them quite open. So uh, on one division, we used actually AI as a clinical endpoint to, for symptom relief. And we actually um, passed it through AI when we didn't uh, pass it, when we looked at kind of the human, um, uh, um, you know, how, how the results were from a human eye. On another, on an, in another division of the FDA in a very complex disease state, uh, world experts were disagreeing on the biopsy reads and, and uh, of some of the you know, top key opinion leaders in the world on this disease state. And we recommended then going to AI where we could have the exact same definition for the read of every single biopsy. And that was refuted. And so it really, you know, I talk, I talk about silos again, but even within the regulatory authorities, you see within the di different divisions that you deal with different uh, positions. So I think it's just continuing to work together, uh, uh, but I do, I do think that it's a, a bigger issue than just the regulatory authorities. Thank you, Nancy. And Corinne, I give you the last word on this. I can just confirm what has already been said, but um, generally speaking, we have for such technologies uh, to decide uh, with um, um, the first data that are available when the product is going to be launched on the market. Of course, very obviously mark. And after that, we can put some milestone in order to, 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 to make the company um, look at the maintenance of its performance during uh, over the time and also to ask for real world data in order to, to monitor and to, to, to have answers on the relevance of the technology and of its performance over the time. So uh, milestone should be the, the one of the answer to, to deal with the speed and to the security. Right, and, and uh, probably was, was adding some standards about how, how things are developed the way uh, Michel was um, was describing in his presentation. Uh, let me ask you another question, and then we'll open for uh, questions from the audience. Um, so, as you think about introducing AI solutions into medical applications, how do you see the role of top down and bottom up? In other words, should the solutions be developed in a kind of um, an um, application centric, uh, disciplinary centric way? and then expand it? Or should we get broad uh, systems like data warehouses and, and, and um, uh, large systems that can then be adopted by each subdiscipline of medicine? So who wants to start? Uh, okay, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, quickly. Um, first, we have a vertical where we work from. And so we were, um, we, we focused on um, what you would call bottom up, which, um, you know, we got our data set and from there we built up our solution. And, and of course, the next step for us would be able to populate those bottom up solution with additional data, which for the moment we can't. Um, so we are two ways to do it. One is to um, use our own system to bring more data. And the other one would be, which would be amazing to bring some uh, external data for, for that. And, and on, on our perspective, um, as an industrial player, we, um, we were faster and it was easier to do a bottom-up uh, uh, you know, solution than a, a top-down one. Any other perspectives? Top-down? Anybody? No, I want to add a comment, probably a little bit not less related to this, which is the use of AI in medicine is a journey, not a destination. That's a big difference that we, are, we need to make. We, we are using these tools to ultimately benefit the patient. So even if when we go even to the former question of the regulatory issues and stuff and the bottom up or top to bottom issue, the, 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 the major point is we need to prove the benefit of the AI either way. And we need to show that we can refine the process with reduced cost, reduced casualties, much less painful victiming 
on phase one, phase two for the drugs or, or the post uh, market surveys for, for the medical devices. So making a big deal of AI sometimes uh, is the major concern. The biggest, and, and this is like a 10 second comment, the biggest comment and critic for the, for the use of AI, at least for the medical devices is they are not validated, okay? So, so then something might go wrong. Actually, this, this uncertainty is the major reason why we need to use AI because then AI can give us the whole picture, like at confine what can go wrong that you actually are practically missing in your clinical practices, in your clinical trials, and then go back and recall or, or make, a, make a survey. So let this device at least explore that domain for you. And with that, probably our sensitivity towards the use of AI would be a little bit reduced. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, the other thing is that typically what I'm finding is successful data is read out, but failed data is not as much read out. And I do think uh, artificial intelligence benefits both from what failed and what won. And so I think, you know, transparency of data, good and bad, is benefit, which currently we, we, we don't, uh, unless it's your own internal data, you don't have that, uh, that full complete set. All right, I think we have a comment or a question from the audience. Hello. I would like just to make a little comment. I don't think that AI should be evaluated or validated differently from drugs. You need to have a clinical validation and it should not be only on data. It should be on also in real life, in practice, uh, if it's decision support system, are physicians following it or yes or not? And what are the endpoints for the patient in terms of efficacy and safety? And at the end of the day, yes, it will take time, like in drugs development. But the idea is that at the end of the day for the patient to have trustful AI solution that also be used by caregivers and patients. If you take, for example, the DIGA example from B Farm, I don't know if some of you know that. You have some solutions that you can go see your physician and ask for a prescription of an app, of, an, uh, of a solution. And most of them are not prescribed because maybe there's a problem for the caregivers or the patients about how they trust the solution. So this is also an important issue that we need to deal with AI solution. Thank you for that. Just, just a, a quick comment, and, and I just want to make very clear. I, um, of course, the the idea of using simulators is not to not do clinical trial. It's just to make sure that first we reduce the cost of the clinical trial, as somebody else has said, but also to make sure that we don't put patients in situations that are um, life threatening for for them, which we can do on on simulators that we can't do for obvious ethic reasons, but of course, there will always be a need to have a real life, um, you know, uh, clinical trial. And, and I wasn't trying to suggest that we should not. Elazar, please go ahead. So uh, one can never speak for regulatory agencies. I, I, I was on the board of the Food and Drug Administration. So allow me to say something to what you've commented on. When AI is used as a drug, it should be regulated in the way drugs are used. When AI is used to guide clinicians in a way that they could gain knowledge from any other venue, reading a book, looking things up on the web, speaking to consultants, then it should specifically not be regulated because it burdens the regulatory community and as you heard from some of the speakers, it delays the introduction. So I think what you're alluding to is that one needs to be precise in definitions. And I, I see Irina's hand, so I would defer further comments to the lawyers. But I will tell you, it's something we've struggled with greatly within the regulatory community. Irina, please go ahead. I just wanted to make you aware that it is, of course, regulated. It's a medical device and it has to comply with medical device regulation. And I think it's the same in the United States. It's a problem uh, for regulators because AI 
systems are changing over time. And I know that FDA has already addressed that issue. There's a huge discussion around it and EMA is still struggling with it. So I, I just, for me to clarify what I said, anything where AI changes what happens to a patient is here. But if it's introducing information, then that is not a regulated issue. I don't know how the situation is in the United States, but under European law, as, as soon as it's used for diagnosis, and this is close to what you just described, it's clearly a medical device and has to be, uh, yeah, it's certified. I mean, it's a little bit different from the clinical trials regulation. It's not the same level of, of uh, testing it, but it depends on how, how, let's say, dangerous it is for patients. So I don't think we're disagreeing. I would just point out one thing. Anything that can be derived from another source in a similar way is not necessarily a device. If you could get the same information from a book, it's not a device. And, and, but and I, I, could, I defer to you. And if I could just jump in on, I think, how pharma companies are looking at it. If we are seeking approval based on that technology, we are looking for validation. However, if we are trying to understand the proof of concept before we enter phase one, it, we then will not, you know, we potentially will not use that. It doesn't have to be validated. It doesn't have to be FDA approved. So I think it depends on kind of how you're using it as well. So uh, this is such an interesting um, uh, debate. Uh, maybe um, we pause this discussion because we have a, a half an hour of a break coming up. We can continue um, to discuss. Um, let me see if there are other questions uh, or issues that the audience wants to uh, raise. Please go ahead in the back. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Mohammed Ben Saeed from uh, Necker, uh, Necker, from uh, Necker uh, Hospital. Uh, I work in medical informatics uh, uh, field for uh, more than uh, 30 years. I was uh, graduating in the States. So I would like to, to react about some uh, uh, well, I, I'm uh, kind of a little uh, um, disturbed in uh, this meeting because we are speaking about AI, we are, don't, we are not speaking about the, uh, the, uh, what the domain expert may bring to the AI. And it is an, an important issue. We are speaking about all what, what data can do, but we don't speak about our resources. And to react to the last comment, uh, let's imagine that AI be a source of, uh, of knowledge, of information. Let's bring new, uh, new discovery or whatever. The difference between uh, the algorithm, we don't know how they are built. They are it's kind of a little black box. It is not a controlled knowledge. We compare it to the physician or the domain expert, who, who, we, we know what is his knowledge. We know the schools he went through, we want to, how can we bring and how can we merge all the information from different sources. So we need to be careful about this. And it's good that regulation is here to protect us, to protect the devices, the devices, and uh, especially then that actually the algorithm are still in domain of research. They are not well established. And there are many criticism going about this. So the point I would like to, ma uh, to make is uh, the role of the domain expert to bring and to participate in the artificial intelligence. Uh, AI and uh, data processing is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is good. It brings a lot of uh, power and empowerment to the physician to make his decision and to improve his decision and to be accepted in the medical community. We still need people who are trained in schools, in medical schools, and we still need to provide them with the, the best tools and to protect the rights of the patient in privacy and in having the, the best treatment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment. So uh, it's it's uh, interesting, right? Because this actually brings up the issue of education and the question of whether 
the users of these AI tools that we're introducing are equipped with understanding how the tools work, with understanding what they can and cannot do, and how to how to reason about the statistical uh, answers provided by the tools. Uh, we have time for one or two more questions from the audience. Anybody else wants to talk about things other than regulation? Yeah, maybe maybe you come on. Um, Christian Please go Chab ahead. Yeah, Christian Chabori from uh, Epita Engineering School. Uh, we we have put up a, a major about healthcare. And what we see is uh, lots of our students are very tech and they, they want to advance at a fast pace, as you, as you said, but the regulations uh, are very slow, as you said. But uh, one example is, for example, about data that could be used in a, for, for medical uh, studies and that are not used because they are not medical data. I'm thinking about mobile phone, for example, uh, smartwatches, maybe some things in between, maybe hairbuds, uh, like uh, that can take temperatures or uh, ET ECGs. Uh, what, how do you see um, AI that could be in incorporated in that kind of uh, IoT? Uh, do you guys want to take it? One yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I, I will tell oh, you. Nancy, okay, go ahead, Nancy. So I, you know, right now, um, data pools are being created to be put together to um, uh, under, so for example, uh, in the US, there's been algorithms that have been written to identify people who have lung cancer that don't know it yet with 95% certainty. Now that's, uh, what do you do with that data? You know, what uh, some have decided to do is, okay, we're going to now uh, detail physicians when a patient comes in and looks like this, they don't follow the typical protocol, they speed up into a different uh, protocol. So, so there are, they, you know, folks are trying to put different data sets together. Um, uh, you know, it could even be shopping cart data to medical data uh, to identify what are those signals that tell us that somebody has a certain disease state. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so we just, are there. Just, just, just a quick comment um, um, on, on that specific topic. Um, and, I, and I just want to um, stress back to what you just said. Um, we are talking about patients. So the data that needs to come into the algorithm needs to be a medical data because we need to make sure that the data that is coming into the algorithm is trustworthy, is, 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 is the representative of what is happening for real. And for example, in our in our solution, um, you know that on the smartwatch, for example, you can have heartbeat, you can have even glycemia level for some that are you know very far from being a medical device. We we won't use them because they're not medical, you know, they're not medical data. And and we cannot use data that is not safe to be used for, for treating a patient. And and that's where that's where we but it doesn't mean that it's not interesting to get that information, but it, it needs to be information that it, it, it is trustworthy because we are at the end treating a patient with a drug that if it's misused, it's, it can kill them. So, um, although, although okay, I think thank you for that. It goes back to how you're using the data. All right, so let's, um, uh, we'll have a quick comment from Farhad and then we'll have our last question to the panel. And then we'll have uh, tea and we can continue the debate over um, regulation and data and anything else you want. Uh, Farhad, 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, I, I can't help not to really comment on what uh, that gentleman over there said. We are by no means here to replace the doctors. Doctor, everything we, at, we uh, always at the discretion of the doctors decide. What we are proposing here is educated decision, quantified decision. With the help of numerical simulation and, and, and AI, we want to give them some quantified data to decide how to do. There are so many alternatives nowadays for surgery and therapy. So we are not deciding for them. We, giving, we are giving them information to have a better decision. All right, so uh, here's my final question for our preeminent panelists. Uh, let's imagine we're 10 years in the future. Uh, what do you see as uh, new capabilities that are provided by AI to empower uh, doctors? Or maybe in, instead of a prediction, what do you want to see happen? What would you like to see happen? So uh, I, I, for one, would love to see 
individualized medicine where everyone uh, can uh, get drugs synthesized according to their physical and circumstantial situation. We're very far from that, but it would be great to work uh, in that direction. And uh, I would love to see little robots that could perform uh, safer incision-free uh, surgeries without pain, without the risk of infection. Farhad. Yeah, on, on the same line of personalized medicine, what I'm expecting and I'm hoping to happen is to have a real some of these adoption of some of these uh, tools that we are developing, so that on the spot in situ while extracting the images, that's what we do in, in hospitals. We extract a lot of images. We we are not using five percent of the information within the images. We, I want those images to be characterized better on on real time basis with the AI, and then virtual surgery or alternative devices could be actually tried virtually, computationally on site, inside the OR, while they are deciding what to do next. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark. Well, um, I don't know about technology because 10 years ago, um, a crazy man went on stage and said, with this telephone, you're going to watch TV and nobody trusts him and nobody believed him. So I don't know what technology will, will do. I believe, it, I hope it will do what you said. But what I'm sure of is that it would put the doctor back into the this one special relation between the doctor and the patient. Technology will be helping the de- doctor to restore that art of doing medicine and 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 um, you know take back that specific special relation uh, between the doctor and the patient. Thank you, Mark. Nancy. So I I would uh, hope for digital mutational twins to specifically understand a patient diagnosis and be able to test on that mutational twin uh, before I actually put it into a patient. And then I would hope to also through AI and chemistry be able to create uh, drugs to treat more than 5% of disease. And so the mutational twin coupled with more specific precision medicine. Wonderful. Corinne? It's difficult to imagine the technologies that will uh, come uh, from 10 years. <laughs> uh, but I would uh, say that uh, in 10 years, I think we, uh, a lot of things we, uh, will, uh, will be achieved and will be developed from the data regulation uh, to, 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 to optimize the, the the, the the beginning <laughs> and the, the the work that are that are that are on, on under construction now and uh, a synergic ecosystem I would say uh, uh, in a ten years horizon. Great. So the data will not be an issue anymore in ten years, right? Okay, Michelle, you have the final word. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think two things. One is uh, data democratization. So that is that individuals can collect, curate, uh, and share their data with organizations that want to do research. And secondly, I think, um, you know, maybe more direct-to-consumer apps that contain AI is probably a a very palpable future, right? As opposed to uh, perhaps these things happening in the hospital setting. Uh, It's about individuals uh, and their objectives and facilitating their care in the longest term possible. That should be achievable. 